good job the bad jokes weren't there The last sort of class today, isn't it? It is indeed. And I was thinking what to do. Why the, after what I did yesterday, the next part is just um, basically jhanas, but I've done that so many times. So today I was going to talk about the gradual training because we have the eightfold path, but we also have the gradual training. This is on page 48 of my little um, sheet, Word of the Buddha. It's actually section five, V, five, the gradual training. And the reason I like this is because this is in many, many, many suttas. And even in a Diga Nikaya and a Majjhima Nikaya, and it shows an alternative way of looking at the Eightfold Path, how enlightenment works. And I also, on page 83 in the PDF file, wow, I'm way ahead of you, page 48, but it's the same thing, it's just different formats. So the gradual training, I'll just read it out first of all, and I will comment on how this relates to the Eightfold Path during the reading out. A rising of a Buddha and the Dhamma. A Buddha appears in the world, accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, well liberated, knower of worlds, incomparable teacher of those who can be taught, teacher of gods and humans, the awakened one, the master, the Buddha. Now there's one phrase, many phrases that I really love, but the one phrase which I always like, and I think Aya Chanda, because she's doing teaching now, she should always keep in mind that the Buddha was the incomparable teacher of those who can be taught. Even the Buddha couldn't teach some people. <laughs> Even he had to give up on them. So whenever I get any sort of person who comes to monastery or comes on one of my retreats and it's just really difficult to train. I never take it personally that I can't train them. Even the Buddha couldn't train some people. And uh, it's far more advanced than myself or Ayachanda. And this is the teacher of those who can be taught. And some people are not ready to be taught yet, maybe later on. I'll never get depressed when somebody doesn't understand a, a word of what I'm saying. And with his own direct knowledge, this is a Buddha, direct knowledge, in other words, what you see for yourself, you have realized this multi-universe with its gods, this world, with all its beings, and he makes it known to others. And of course, that translation of multi-universe, you know where that comes because I was a physicist. Uh, so he knows a huge amount of uh, the beings in this world or how even the, the cosmology of the universe works and you know once that uh oh, this is a this is on a, another tangent which i love going on tangents because they're interesting that there is one sutta only one sutta where it says that the lifespan of beings in this one realm are just like a hundred years but every day in that realm is like uh, like a hundred years of the human realm and so the heavenly realms, they're much longer. And every next heavenly realm is four times longer than the one before it. And that way you can work out the, the, the highest realm of, uh, in the, the karma loka, the world of stuff, is the Brahma realm. And you can work out just a simple mathematics, how long is the Brahma realm? And the Brahma realm, is actually the same age as the universe, of our universe. And I remember just working that out once, I forget exactly the number, but it worked out roughly about, I think, 20,000 million years. I thought, wow, that's fascinating because that is in the ballpark of the age of our universe. You know, it's not too far. I think it was about 40% or 30% of the time which uh, astrophysicists 
believed since the Big Bang. I thought that was really fascinating. But anyway, that's Noah of the uh, multiverse and all the other uh, stuff. And also, I can't resist this. Also, there are, Buddha says, it's only one sutta, there are other world systems with other beings. Basically, the Buddha was confirming the existence of aliens. Have you seen an alien? I know aliens exist because once, once when I went over to, um, uh, oh, I think the first time from Australia to uh, Heathrow Airport, I saw it there. They had like a line they had for EU citizens, British citizens, and aliens. So the UK realized there were aliens and coming into, I never saw any funny looking people, but it did have the line there for aliens. Okay, I'll, I'll be serious again then. Now, <laughs> don't talk about aliens. But anyway, with his own direct knowledge, he has realized this multi universe with its gods, this world with all its beings, including aliens, and he makes it known to others. And the Buddha teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. With the right meaning and phrasing, he reveals a perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. Even the Buddha made it clear he revealed a perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. Nothing to be added later. And anyway, that's the arising of a Buddha and the Dhamma. And then confidence. You hear that Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, you acquire faith in the Buddha. Possessing that faith, that confidence, you consider thus, household life is troublesome and busy. Life as a monastic is free and relaxed. It's supposed to be anyway. It is over here once you get a good monastery going. It is not easy while living in a house to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure. Suppose I shave off my hair, put on the orange robe and go forth from the world of life into a monastery. On a later occasion, having given away all your wealth, abandoning your circle of relatives and friends, you shave off your hair, put on the orange robes and go forth from the home life into the monastic life. This is great monasteries, good monasteries. You know, people like Arya Chanda is just, you know, giving so much, so much of a blood and sweat you know, to get a monastery for bikunis, a real one in the UK. And so I just got lots of gratitude for her sacrifice for that. But anyway, once it happens, which it does eventually over the years, then when you have gone forth, you train in the monastic way of life. You abstain from killing living beings with rod and weapon laying it aside. Conscientious, merciful, you, you live compassionate to all living beings. So you can pat snakes on the head and the ants you know, won't bite you. So many times that in a monastic life, you know, you've had snakes crawling over you. But I remember doing this chant once, it's the, the chant of the monastic walls. And I was doing the chanting and the monk sitting right in front of me, he had his hands up, you know, paying attention to the chant, and a little head poked up over his left shoulder. It was a snake. The snake had crawled up his back and put his head above this monk's shoulder. And then the monk could actually see that something was up his shoulder, and he turned around, and the snake turned around, and the snake and this monk were eyeballing one another. It was just hilarious. None of them were just scared or um, aggressive. Just the, the little snake just came to listen to the chanting. Get some good karma, I reckon. But anyway, the monk just very carefully just put his robe down so the snake could fall slowly down without hurting himself and then crawl away. So there's wonderful things with animals like snakes and uh, monks living together at peace. Anyway, uh, you live compassionate to all living beings. You abstain from taking what's not given, taking only what is given, 
wanting only what is given. You not By not stealing, you abide in purity. You abstain from all sexual activity. Living apart from others, you abstain from the lay practice of sexual intercourse. Don't need it anymore. It's nice and peaceful. You abstain from false speech. You speak only the truth. Are trustworthy and reliable. You're no deceiver of the world. And sometimes that's such a rare thing to find in this world. People actually do tell the truth. And so when the people tell the truth, please respect that. If they've done something wrong or something stupid, like I've done many times, you listen to that, you accept it, and you just, uh, uh, truth is more important than being right. In other words, you just listen to what people do, what they say. What was some of the stupid things which I have done? One of the stupid things which I don't mind telling people I have done was when I was, oh, when I was doing a funeral service for somebody it was for a Sri Lankan, but the Sri Lankan names are really long, and I was getting quite confused. The main reason I was doing this funeral was because it was a, a, a disciple, and one of his parents had died. When I started the speech, you know, to introduce everybody at the funeral home, then I knew I had a 50-50 chance of getting it wrong. And of course, if you had Murphy's Law, means that you do get it wrong. I say we're coming here today to sort of pay respects to the deceased mother of my disciple, blah, blah, blah. And then this woman in the front stood up and said, it's not me who's dead, it's my, it's my husband. And everybody burst out laughing. This was a funeral, it's supposed to be serious, and I got the name wrong. And as a result of that, that it was actually just, it was a very a funeral which was alive. People do make mistakes. I got her name wrong. Anyway, she, she corrected me straight away. It's not me who's dead, it's my husband. Anyway, the way she said it was really quite amusing. Anyway, to me anyway. So you abstain from device, divisive speech. You do not tell tales in order to divide people, but you are one who reunites those who are divided. A promoter of friendships who enjoys harmony, rejoices in harmony, delights in harmony, I speak of words that promote harmony. You abstain from harsh speech. You speak only words that are gentle and pleasing to the ear, and lovable words that go to the heart, are courteous, desired by the many, and agreeable to the many. This is like virtue. And here I'm going to, because I was talking today, getting a bit confused about Nandi Wisala and Anguri Mala and Nala Giri the Elephant. Somebody remind me the other day that the story of Nandi Wisala, the ox, that was actually in the suttas. And it was in a Vinaya. It was actually the Buddha's explanation of why not to say harsh speech to anybody. And it's such a lovely story. I'm going to say it again now. That, that Nandi Wisala, the ox, he was old. <laughs> And his owner, the farmer, was also old. They'd been working, toiling away hard in the fields. And then one day, Nandi Wisala came up to his owner and said, Master, it's about time we retire. But the master, we can't, we haven't got enough money. We have to keep on working. And Nandi Wisala the ox said, I have a plan. The plan is this. I am old, but I'm still very strong. And just like even before Disney, all the animals in the Buddha's teaching could also talk. <laughs> so Nandi Wisala told his master, you go to the rich man of the, of the town and tell that rich merchant that I, Nandi Wisala, the ox, can pull a hundred carts all full of stones and the, 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 the master said, you can't do that. I can. Trust me. So he went to the, the, uh, the big merchant in the town and said that I, my ox, can pull a hundred carts full of stones. The rich man in the, in the town said, no, no ox can do that. My ox can. And I will bet you 100,000, not rupiah, 100,000, uh, 
pounds sterling. That my ox can do that's a lot of money. You can retire on a hundred thousand, can you these days? I don't know. Can you retire on that? I don't know. A million? Two million? I don't know. I say a million. I bet you one million. <laughs> The Vioxx can put all these carts. I don't know much about money. I just raise it, that's all. Someone else spends it. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, the one million dollars, a pound, sorry. No ox can do that. I can. So the rich man accepted the bet. And he needed a hundred carts. So he had to tell everybody in town to get a hundred carts and fill them all with stones and tie the ox, Nandi Wisala, to the front of those, those cart carts. And the, uh, the farmer, the owner of Nandi Wisara, went up onto the front cart and shouted, pull those carts. Nandi Wisara just stood there, did nothing. Pull those carts, you stupid ox. He did nothing. Look, I'm telling you, you are dumb, stupid ox. Pull those carts. He just stood there. And even the man, the farmer, got out a stick and hit the ox, the poor ox. Pull those carts. And the ox couldn't do it. The farmer was ruined. He didn't know how he could pay back a million uh, pounds. So he got off the carts, went under a tree, and started crying. Believing in his ox could do all these things and couldn't. And as he was crying and wondering, what would he do with his life now? He had no money left, nothing. He was ruined. And at that, he felt a wet nose in his ear. And that wet nose belonged to his ox. Why are you crying, master? Because I'm ruined. You said you could pull all those cards, but you can't. You deceive me. Oh, but I can, said the ox. No, you can't, but I can. Then why didn't you? Because, master, you shouted at me. Because, master, you call me stupid. Because, master, you hit me with a stick. That's no way to treat a friend. Now, said the ox, you go back to that rich man. And this time you bet two million pounds sterling that I, Nandi Visala, can pull that, those carts. They're still there. They haven't untied them yet. But this time, speak kindly to me. So he went back to the ox, the rich man, and said, okay, I bet you two million this time. And then the rich man said, it's easy money. Why not? And the carts are still there. So he accepted the bet. And they went back to those carts. The uh, master tied the ox to the front cart and he got on top of the front cart himself, the master. And this time with everybody watching in the town, especially the rich man, he said, dear ox, kind ox, if it's not too much trouble for you, would you mind trying to pull these carts just a little bit, if you don't mind? And because he was speaking kindly to his ox, the ox started pulling, straining every muscle in his body, with sweat coming out of his legs and his haunches. You know what happened? Nothing. Because the carts were too heavy. So the owner said, look, I know we're going to lose everything, but don't worry about that. Their friends are more important than money. And at that, the ox tried again, pulling so hard that, that steam was coming out of his nostrils and also out of his ears. He was really, you can see his veins coming up from his skin. He was pulling so hard. And what happened? Nothing. Those cars were really heavy. And so the owner said to Daddy Wisala, Oh, look, give it up. Don't try so hard. Now, our friendship and your happiness and health is more important than anything else in the whole world for me. So give it up. Take a rest. Stop trying to pull. And at that, Nandi Wisara 
He really went for it. The veins were almost popping out of his skin. The, the legs, you could see them hot with effort and steam was pouring out of his eyes and his mouth, actually not out of his my eyes, because his eyes were bulging like they were gonna fall out of the sockets. That was really incredible effort this ox was doing. And wow, you'd think he'd explode because of the effort, but instead of exploding, you heard another sound. The creak of one of the wheels started to turn. And then another wheel, and all the people lining up were so excited, like a football match. And you're just coming back from just defeat and you're actually going to win. They were all cheering. Come on, Ox. Come on, Ox. You'll never walk alone. I think that's a Liverpool chart. <laughs> and they all started cheering the Ox and the Ox was really feeding on the people's enthusiasm. And another wheel started to creak and then another wheel, one after the other. One after the other, the, the wheels were turning. And in the end, after a few minutes, everyone was cheering, going berserk with joy and uh, an amazing feat for 400 carts. The last cart was standing where the first cart used to, to be. And everyone was cheering. Even the rich man started to cheer, even though he lost one million. So because he had to pay back one million from the first bet, but got two million on the second bet. So the farm was one million pounds ahead and everyone was cheering and people realized if you want an ox to do the impossible you never shout at it you never give it a hard time you say dear ox dear uh, uh, chanda the ox <laughs> what are the ox face it can't be done just relax and with encouragement, eventually, amazing things happen. And this is actually the story which the Buddha told with a few little um, uh, exaggerations. Uh, for uh, using uh, not harsh speech, but speak words which are gentle and pleasant to the ear and lovable. Words that go to the heart are courteous, desired by the many and agreeable to the many. And that actually just encourages people. Instead of shouting at people, we encourage people. They want to help. And that's how they do help. And you abstain from useless speech. You speak at the proper time. Speak what is truthful. Speak on what is beneficial. Speak on the Dharma and the training. At the proper time, you speak words that are worth treasuring or authoritative, succinct, and beneficial. That's one of the reasons why that we monks and nuns do tell jokes sometimes. The reason why we tell jokes sometimes is because sometimes in my talks, I look at people and they're falling asleep. You tell a joke and they wake up. Or as this Tibetan monk once said, that when you tell a joke and make people laugh, then their mouths are open. And that is when you can put in the pill of dung. <laughs> I thought that was a very really beautiful way of describing it. Anyway, um, you abstain from injuring seeds and plants. This is for monastics. You practice eating only in the morning, abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time. Look at me. I've been eating only in the morning for the last 47 years. And you put on weight. Look, if I had to eat in the evening, oh my goodness, I'd explode by now. I'd be such a big butterball <laughs> that I would really roll around. But I enjoy just who I am and I'm at peace with, with me. And sometimes I tell jokes about that. People say, are you going to be around next week? I said, I'm around all the time. I tell me now. You know my nickname amongst my friends? What they call me, with full respect, with my permission, they call me Ajan Donut. Donut. Why do they call me Ajan Donut? For three reasons. One, I'm sweet. Two, I'm round. And three, like a donut, you've got a hole in the middle. You're holy. <laughs> That's why 
people over in Indonesia used to call me Ajahn Donuts. I don't mind. It's great. So also, you abstain from dancing, singing, music, and movies. They just uh, take your mind away from being peaceful. You abstain from wearing adornments, fragrances, and cosmetics. You abstain from using luxurious furnishings. You abstain from accepting money. And that, for the monastic, is one of the most important ones. So you, just, you can't just go out and spend whatever you want. You know, you've got to ask permission for it. Even if Paul Ajahn Chanda wants to go overseas to have a bit of a break, she just can't just go and get money out of the bank and just, well, she has to ask the committee, the trust and stuff like that. And of course, we'd always, like I'm, I'm a member of the trust. I'm the chairman of the trust. I'll, I'll approve anything. <laughs> Well, not really anything, but anyway, approve things which are really important for you. And you abstain from accepting raw grain, raw meat, servants and slaves, livestock, fields and land, going on errands and running messages, buying and selling, practicing fraud, accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding and trickery, abstain from wounding, murdering, imprisoning, extortion, plunder and violence. In other words, you don't looking for money by extorting or by buying and selling or by doing business. That you, know, you depend upon just the kindness of your friends and supporters. And quite frankly, that you know, I know many of your supporters in and a company, anything you need, they'll be more than happy to get for you. Contentment. One of the problem is when they ask you what you want, there's just a nice bit of rest, a bit of place to stay. Or, put my head down in the same place every night instead of a new place every week. <laughs> but the ordinary things, sometimes you don't need very much. You become content with patched robes to protect your body and with arms food to maintain your stomach. And wherever you go, you travel taking only these with you. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. I've never seen a bird migrating, like even coming from England to Australia or from uh, UK to, to um, USA, carrying a backpack. Have you ever seen birds carrying backpacks on their back when they're flying or carrying little baggage or, or bum bags or whatever else you have? They don't carry that. They just they fly nice and free. And I always remember trying to do that makes you feel that you are light. So you become content with these things. And when you, when you follow this noble virtue and contentment, you experience within yourself a delightful bliss, the joy of being blameless and, and simple to live. And now that's a wonderful thing if you can give that freedom you know, to monastics. So they don't have to cook food for themselves. They don't have to buy stuff or get stuff ordered. You can actually go to find out where they are and feed them. They don't need much to live. And oof, quite frankly, just over here in Perth, people really enjoy feeding monks and nuns. It's weird. Sometimes I ask people, why do you like coming to Bodhinyana Monastery? These are the visitors that come every day surprise with the best food they say we enjoy it so they come here they give us delicious food and they give a donation for the privilege of feeding us <laughs> and coming all this way and it's, even i know from a few times i can practice this you give something to another you don't eat it for yourself you give it to another you get so much more happiness out of that enjoy looking after one another. It's more delicious to see someone else eating something you like and eating it for yourself. And anyway, and that gives you joy. Now that's the contentment, just with your precepts, the right speech, right action, right livelihood, and the right motivation behind that. Now, does that make any, any assemblies for you? You've got the faith before, which is coming when the Buddha arises in the world. That's the first type of right view. And right motivation, intention, right speech, actual livelihood. 
This is referring to the first five of the Eightfold Path. And after this, in the usual gradual training, the next thing you should do is restraint of the senses. And this is one of the main reasons I'm reading this out, because the restraint of the senses, that is in the place of right efforts in the Eightfold Path. This is a gradual training. Instead of uh, right effort, we have restraint of the senses. And how the restraint of the senses is explained by the Buddha, when you see an object, you do not let yourself get sucked in by marks and features that generate defilements. Since if you left the faculty of sight unguarded, unskillful states of wanting and aversion, the first of the two, first two of the five hindrances, would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom when seeing. You guard the faculty of sight, and you undertake the restraint of sight. Having heard a sound, having noticed a smell, having sensed a taste, having felt a bodily feeling, having cognized something in your mind, you do not let yourself get sucked in by the marks and features that generate defilements. Since if you left the mind faculty unguarded, same with all these other senses, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom with the mind. You guard the mind and you undertake the restraint of the mind. This is called restraint of the senses. You know what disturbs you. you know that if you left those senses unguarded, especially during a retreat, and then you'll find that you lose the peace and stillness. And when you value that peace and stillness, which you get from meditation, oh, you don't want to have it disturbed by stupid thoughts or getting upset when somebody bangs the door or makes a sound which you don't like. Instead, you restrain your senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and also your mind. So it never gets overexcited and never gets sucked in by features and things, which are only part of what you're experiencing. Instead of you guard the mind and make sure it's at peace and happy. Makes them happy because when you follow this noble restraint of the senses, you experience within yourself an even more delightful bliss. And that is the joy of being unagitated, Abhayaseka Sukha. You know what it's like to have an agitated mind? Where did that come from? You weren't restraining the senses. Keep those senses simple, peaceful, unagitated. And that is a lot of joy, a lot of happiness. Sometimes I've noticed that in myself. There's a joy there all the time. When I restrain myself, and when I keep my precepts, it uplifts the level of happiness in a human being. People always think, oh, you're a monk, all these rules you have to keep. And a bhikkhuni has to keep even more rules than a monk does. You are so lucky having more rules to keep and more joy to develop, more freedom, more peace. But beyond that, there's a restraint of the senses. You don't get sucked into the world. You have another happiness comes up instead. And that happiness is even more satisfying. So said the Buddha. And after restraint of the senses, we get to what's called clear comprehension. After Samma Vayama, the next comes Samasati. So this is actually almost a little bit of uh, Satipatthana. You act in full comprehension of the purpose when going forward and returning. What are you doing this for? You know. You act in full comprehension of the purpose when looking ahead and looking away, when flexing and extending your limbs, when wearing your clothes and carrying things. You act in full comprehension of the purpose regarding eating, drinking, defecating, and urinating, walking, standing, 
sitting, sleeping, being awake, talking and keeping silent. Why do you talk? Why do you keep silent? When you know what the purpose is, you get a lot of wisdom and understanding in the normal functions of your daily life. And that's the next part of the gradual training, which the Buddha said is almost like, not an alternative, but another way of explaining the Eightfold Path. And then, <laughs> when you have developed this noble virtue, this noble restraint of the sense faculties, and this noble clear comprehension, you go to a secluded dwelling place, such as a forest, the foot of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside, a cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, or a nice quiet room in your house. The place where you're sitting right now. It's amazing just how, with a little bit of initiative, even places in your house, you can turn into a place which is secluded, quiet, and sufficient for meditation. You sit down comfortably and establish mindfulness as a priority. Of course, you've heard this before. This is meditation on the breath. But as it says it here, it's more direct, the meditation thing here. Abandoning, wanting for the world of the five senses. So you don't want anything there. This is meditation time. So all the things of the five senses, you just abandon. Don't want anything there at the moment. I'm just meditating. You're letting go of things. Letting go of the world of seeing, hearing, smelling, taste and touch and all the things associated with that, just for the period of the meditation. And the world of the five senses is, again, this world of Bokeh okay, Abhijja, the first hindrance. You abide with a mind free from wanting. You purify the mind from desire. This is how it, the first part of the meditation is explained in the gradual training. Okay, that's something you do. But in the sense is what you do, but you can't do abandoning your desire because that's a desire in itself. You know, there's beautiful ways of letting go, putting things down. And that's the way the desire for the things of the world cease. Abandoning aversion. You abide with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all beings, including yourself, your being, you count as well. Don't, not every other being, it's you and all the beings in the universe. Thus you purify the mind from aversion. Abandoning dullness and drowsiness, you abide with a mind free from dullness and drowsiness. Bright-minded, clearly comprehending, you purify the mind from dullness and drowsiness. And to purify it, a lot of times it should just conserve your energy. Dullness and drowsiness is a low energy state. How come you got low energy? Sometimes it's the case you didn't sleep well last night, or that you've eaten too much, or it may be some other sort of sickness in the body. But a lot of time it's because we think too much, we worry too much, we plan too much. Which is one of the reasons I often say you never do today what you can put off until tomorrow because you might die tonight. Never just be this person who always has to do stuff. If you look in your, your kitchen, you find the clean dishes already washed up in the shelves are more than the dirty dishes in the sink. Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Sometimes people think I'm, I'm just a, a lazy monk. It's not you're a lazy monk. You put your energy into things which are more worthwhile. And with the, oops, and abandoning restlessness and remorse, you abide unag unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. You purify the mind from restlessness and remorse. You're unagitated. What agitates you? What people say about you? What you try to live up to some standard and sometimes you fail or people don't get it, so you're agitated. There's one saying which I heard such a long time ago, which is so beautiful, that when you're in your 20s, 
you have to dress up and be attractive, get all the right speech, because in your 20s, you're very concerned what other people think of you. It's important. In your 40s and 50s, you get this wonderful self-confidence. And the way I heard it, please, well, well, as they said it, that you couldn't give a damn what other people think of you. You just go and do it anyway. And in your 60s, you finally figure out that people weren't thinking about you anyway. <laughs> so you don't have to worry what other people think of you. They think of themselves most of the time. So in other words, you don't have to worry, be agitated what other people say or do. So the mind is peaceful, so it doesn't get rest, restless. You don't get agitated, all the things which you still have to do in this life. Oh my goodness. When I think of all the things I still have to do. Oh. I said, no, no, never mind. I'll do it another day. Never do today what you can put off until tomorrow. That tells people just how they can have a peaceful moment. Lots of things to do in the morning, but who knows? See what happens. And what's the other thing with, oh, lastly, about the past. People get so agitated about their past. And sometimes they, they have this idea, oh, if, if I'd have stayed in Burma, if I hadn't sort of, uh, if I had to be born as a man instead of a woman, if I'd have uh, got enlightened when I was seven years of age, if, but all those ifs, that is a cause for agitation. And because of that, I often said, I used a new phrase, a new word about the past. The past is ineffable. You can't if the past. If something else had happened, if I was born some another place, if I was a different gender, if I was different, born in a different time, if, 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 if. You can't if the past. The past is ineffable. You let it all go. This is the word, sometimes they call it ineffable. But ineffable, I couldn't understand what it means. You can't f the past. But F, the effing something was a rude word. And I thought, you know, you can't use that. So ineffable was not a very good meaning to me. They said, God is ineffable. Do we mean you can't sort of say the, the F word to God? <laughs> Didn't make sense. But it's much more sensible and useful as a spiritual person to say the past is ineffable. It's gone. Let it go. Anyway, so you let go of the past, which means you're not agitated by the past. And lastly, having abandoned doubt, you have gone, you abide having gone beyond doubt. I'm perplexed about wholesome states. What are nimittas? What are jhanas? What is peace? What is release? What is insight? Real insight. You know, how you can know these things and overcome doubt is actually by your own experience and knowing that these things lead to peace and freedom. It's like the sign of insight is not that you're a smart ass and can write books and argue the point on coffee tables or on blogs, on retreats, or blogs on websites. That's not a sign of wisdom. The sign of insight and wisdom is that you have peace and stillness, you're calm. So, uh, abandoning doubt, you have gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states, you purify the mind from doubt. You can experience things, it's real. And lastly, the jhanas, which is the last part of the gradual training, just like the last part of the Eightfold Path, Sama Samadhi. Having abandoned the five hindrances, you've just done that through the meditation. Having abandoned the five hindrances, totally free from the five senses, free from unwholesome states, you enter upon and abide in the first jhana, wherein the mind moves on to the object of bliss and holds on to it, the object being joy and pleasure caused by being totally free from the five senses. <sighs> like when you're free of a sickness, you're free of a heavy burden, you've been released from jail. <sighs> peace and bliss, and that's very still. And when the mind stops moving on to the objects and stops holding on to it, you enter upon the Biden's second jhana, 
which has trust in the object. You have got the confidence. You don't have to hold it anymore. It's not going to go anywhere. And you let go of holding it, and that becomes more peaceful. And then you experience a unity of mind without any movement or holding. The joy and pleasure caused by perfect stillness. This is when the mind is still, doesn't move at all. And that is so fantastic, the joy and pleasure of that. With the fading away of joy, you abide mindful and fully aware, experience of bliss purified from joy. You enter upon abiding the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, one has a pleasant abiding indeed, who has such mindfulness and equanimity. You're very mindful, very content. These are not trances where you haven't got a clue what the heck's going on. Perfectly aware, but never as aware as in the fourth jhana. Having abandoned pleasure and pain, all Vedana from the five senses. And with the disappearance of joy and grief, all Vedana from the sixth sense, except for equanimity, the contentment. So that's all the sense you've got left, the sixth sense, the mind. No joy, no no sort of uh, aversion, but just this beautiful contentment, which the Buddha said is a, is a joy, really. It's a joy, fear of joy. And it's a bit of an oxymoron. It's not trying to be more Zen than the Zen master because the Zen masters hadn't arrived yet. This was just noticing that contentment and peace is one of the highest of happinesses. A different flavor of happiness, but still qualifies. Called Upeka Sukha. You enter, enter upon and abide in the fourth jhana, which has only neutral mental Vedana, remaining just pure mindfulness with contentment. That's the gradual training. And it's so similar to the Eightfold Path that I make use of that to understand the Eightfold Path, to put those two together as a one path to enlightenment taught by the Buddha. And the lovely thing which really stands out, the gradual training, is just the joy of it, the bliss of it. It may start difficult, but after a while, when you get into it, you get happier and happier and, oh, happier. So anyway, that is the marketing of the gradual training, the happiness path. So anyway, that's a gradual training and I've gone over time as usual. But now is the opportunity to go to the toilet if you need to. Sometimes you go on meditation retreats and wonder why you can't have one of these little bottles they have in the, the hospitals so you don't have to go very far. <laughs> what are those bottles called? Mm -hmm. You know, you know I what know I mean. What you mean. Yeah. yeah. My so dad can... has one for the car. <laughs> you and I shouldn't say urinate that, urinate that. But he does. <laughs> <laughs> they said that in Thailand when they had all these big, years ago, and all these uh, big traffic jams. They had to get these little things because sometimes it took hours and hours to get home. And they would just had to, you know, to relieve themselves. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And even, okay, I don't mind saying this. Even when I went to Wampopong once, it was Ajahn Chah's, it was his birthday. It was his, anyway, it was, I think it was his one year after his, uh, his cremation. And anyway, the Ajahn Liam, who was now in charge, said, uh, anyone who wants to go and uh, pay respects to Ajahn Mahabur, we're going to go there uh, tomorrow. You know, the buses are all arranged. So that's a nice idea, and go. So he got on the bus, and he came around the bus with, I think, two or three plastic bags to every monk, <laughs> and about a half a dozen rubber bands. What are those for? We're sort of, there's no time to stop if you want to go to urinate. So these are the bags. You can urinate in these and the, and the rubber bands to make sure that it doesn't leak. <laughs> and they said that was how monks would travel in Thailand on a four or five hour bus journey. There was no toilet in the back of the bus. and There's no place we could stop. Fortunately, we did actually find I think the monks rebelled in the front coach, said, no, we're going to stop to urinate instead of doing it in plastic bags in the bus. But anyway, I don't know if that made you interested in what it was like to be a monk in those days. Plastic bags and rubber bands. 
<laughs> okay, so we can actually start the questions. One minute, okay. I'll just have some water. Okay. So for those who have questions today, there's not a lot of time. So please see if you can keep it concise. It's actually the last question session to Ajahn. Um, there'll be one more with me tomorrow. Oh, and tonight, actually. So yeah, lots more time. But this is the last with Ajahn. So if you have Jana questions, especially, he's the one. Okay. <laughs> Shall we start? I have only yes. one question so far. Is that right, right Derek? Only one so far? No. <laughs> nah. I'll just wait for, see if any more are coming. Uh, or maybe we just do it. Yeah, just do it. Okay. Uh, okay. We talked quite a lot in Jana Grove Rains 2019 about this. I had an incident in meditation. I disappeared fully. For a while, Yay. it was only mind consciousness. Yay. Mind consciousness. Not Vitaka Vichara, not Piti Sukha, nothing. Yeah. Only knowing with nothing to know. Neither this me. Then I came back and had all of this like a memory. The question is, what does that world really exist? Like this planet Earth? Was that real or is it real in the way of the mind where everything is fabricated? When you said that Mara manifests as the delusion of self, is this a metaphor? Mara, sorry, I didn't get that. Mara manifests as the delusion of self? Yeah. yeah. When you said sure that Mara manifests as the delusion of self, is this a metaphor? I'm not quite sure either. Oh, yeah, the delusion of self without thinking that you are mm. and that you own things. Because if you own things, then you are vulnerable to things being taken away. Even things like, you know, losing your life. It's not my life. I don't own it. Why are you afraid? If you know you don't own things, then nothing can scare you. I've often thought that when I was young, the, because you know, we were brought up in a Christian culture, the scariest thing was like of some devil coming up in, and whispering into your ear, I've come to take your soul. And these days, if they said that, I said, yeah, you can have it. Nothing there. <laughs> what do you want? Because why is that scary? Because we think we own it. We're attached to it. When you're attached to nothing, then when somebody comes to steal from you or take something from you, there's no fear at all. You realize you don't own things. You've got nothing to lose. That's a sort of a nice little way of understanding where fear comes from. But anyway, but that's a deep question. And those are <coughs> one of those questions I'd have to sort of sit in front of you and discuss it at length. Because usually when your body totally disappears, I think it may have disappeared a bit too fast. Because usually, as it disappears slowly, it gets more and more beautiful, more and more delightful. Ooh. And maybe just that time you weren't appreciating how joyful and, and sublime these things vanishing. Good. Okay, another deep meditation question. Last night with the Q&A with Ben Chanda, there was a meditation moment. I had a very intensive session. I started to see soft colors everywhere and gradually intensified until it became a full environment of warm colors. This feeling turned into a kind of blanket that slowly draped around me, rolled me up in warmth like a big hog. Slowly, I start to notice that all feeling starts to disappear, first in the fingertips, arms, legs, and all over the body. In the beginning, I could move my head a little, but that was gone too. I was now, oh, hang on. I was now curled up there. In the meantime, I could still hear Venchanda talking as if it was an out of the body feeling while I floated around in nothingness. After a while, I awoke and since then had a feeling of tingling all over my body, as if the body was vibrating like the movement of a speaker's cone sound system. It lasted all night. I got very little sleep, too much energy. What is the best way to go about after such a beautiful yet intense meditation? Thank you. Okay. What you do is 
Don't worry so much to try to describe it to yourself, but notice what was missing. What had disappeared? Because if it disappears, the subject of change, subject of disappearing, now that can't be what belongs to you. And these are like burdens. You lose the past, you lose ideas of the future. In those deep meditations, you lose your body. And you're just so peaceful and so blissed out. You don't need to describe anything. You don't need to have a theory about it. But you, you know it, you feel it, experience it. And then you actually get rid of a lot of attachments in this world. This is where insight really comes from. When things vanish, they become a tadpole. You're a tadpole, now you're a frog. You jumped out of the lake. Now you feel what it's like. So little by little, let that experience, you remember it very easily. Let it teach you. It's like this, you've discovered this big seam of gold in the mines. And there's so much time you can go back in there and just get a bit more gold. And it will feed you from so much suffering in life. You find that it's wanting which causes suffering. You don't want anything in the whole world because you're peaceful. Then you press out. I was suffering for a little while. Excellent. Okay. Next, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Today, instead of trying to stop my mind, I tried to stop myself and to calm myself. I said things like, dear me, it's okay to be critical, etc." And I've noticed good. that in this way, my mind started to cool down too. And we had yeah. good company together. In the end, yeah. I feel better, but I still have doubt that this is the correct way to stop and be still. Please help. Don't have doubts intellectual or just because it's not what I said or the book said or what Ayachamba said. If it works, use it. A little by little, you'll understand why it works and how to take it further with other types of letting go as well. It's a good, it's what you said sounds perfectly fine to me. You're not cooling the mind down, you're cooling you down. You know, this was one of the problems I had, just to mention it to everybody. When just I was developing lots of nimittas, just in the, in the range retreat meditation many, many years ago, the beautiful nimittas, very bright and just enjoyable, but they wouldn't stay still. And then I was just really struggling to try and keep these nimittas still. And then it was just while I was shaving, you know, shaving my face one day in the mirror, and it just struck me that if I tried to hold the mirror still, the image in the mirror would still move because I was moving. And so I decided to hold me still. And then the image in the mirror stopped moving. And that was the simile which uh, solved the problem. If you try and hold your mind still, it's like holding the mirror still. Hold the one who's looking still. And then what you see in the mirror becomes still. It's a little metaphor. And I think it's what you did. It's brilliant. And that means the limiter can be still. And then it really, really gets deep. <laughs> then the jams happen. So okay. good insight. Great. There's lots of quite long and detailed questions here. So, um, hmm. okay. I'll go for a, a slightly shorter one, but there's a lot of other ones as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just see what we can do. Yeah, because they're quite, it's good if you answer them. Dear Ajahn, how much gentle perseverance should one apply to their practice? Oh, just 100%. Just be gentle and persevere. There's nothing more to do. Nothing. Don't persevere with, with unkindness and criticism, but just to be the gentle and be the patient. So instead of perseverance, I like patience much better. Okay. Dear Ajahn, I've been very encouraged to explore the mind more fully, emboldened to open to the possibility of nimitta and jhana. I do know at least two people who've explored jhana who then experienced psychosis and terror. Uh -huh. This brings about a fear in me of also losing my mind for a while. Could you please speak to this? Thank you so much. The humor is conducive of relaxation and opening. Yes, I have never heard or seen of anyone who got a real jhana, got into any psychosis at all. 
I think that is whatever those people experienced was probably not real jhanas. These days, the, now the word is out, the jhanas are important, they were taught by the Buddha, and people, ordinary lay people can attain. And there was a time when even when I started teaching jhanas, I was told off by very senior monks, don't teach that. I was really surprised. And I also knew that ever in Vietnam, they had this unified Buddhist Sangha in Vietnam, and for many years, there was a ruling that you should not teach jhana to lay people. Now, please don't blame me for that, because I didn't say that. I rebelled against it. Why not teach the very heart of the Buddhist teachings? And so that these days that uh, jhana is now getting popular in the sense that people know it's there. But the problem is that many people try their hardest, they want to attain jhana, so they actually lower the standard, or they call the United States jhana light, L-I-T-E. It's not real jhanas. And if I keep saying that, people just get very upset at me. But it's not real jhanas. The real jhanas, you just so blissed out, you can't get psychosis, nothing negative to it at all. It's just bliss and happiness. The only problem might be, because this happened to when this, uh, I was asked to speak to this lady in Penang, and they said she, she hadn't got psychosis at all. She was perfectly functioning. And, but then she had this experience, and it was worrying her and troubling her. What the heck was it? And uh, when she came to see me, she'd gone to see many psychologists and psychiatrists in Malaysia. They said no one could fix her up. And they asked me to her, speak to her. And when she described what she had, and I said, you just experienced a jhana. And I said a few other things about that experience. And when I said a few other things, what she hadn't told me, her eyes lit up. Yeah, at last, somebody understands what I went through. It wasn't anything unpleasant. It's just she didn't know what it meant. It was powerful for her. But what the heck was it? And so as long as people explain the, the jhanas properly, where they come from, what they do, and how you know, to deal with them, there's no psychosis at all. It's just totally pleasant and wonderful. So I'm not quite sure what sort of psychosis you mean, but I would pretty much expect that what they did was not real jhanas. Number two, you can't force the mind into jhanas. It's, it's a letting go, a massive letting go. And it's only when you do things and force things you get any psychological problems at all. So you just go according to nature. No damage is ever done, just a lot of healing happens. You come out afterwards just wonderful and happy. But that's honest. I've never seen anybody who has a real jhana have any psychosis afterwards. I've seen many cancers just vanish, just the tumors disappear. People just get a different meaning in their life and so peaceful, so happy. Simplify their life much more. But psychosis, I've never seen that. Not through jhanas. But anyway, next question. Okay, there's a, quite a few different types of questions about jhanas and streaming entry and also about fear of cessation. So I think I'll do that one first because there's yes. two around that. Good question, um, <laughs> thank you for the great retreat. If practicing the path leads to cessation and everything ceases, then what's the point of life and living? Why do I feel that cessation is a poor reward for all the work we have to do? Why do we have to go through all this for everything just to cease? Why did we live in the first place if it leads to nothing? <laughs> and I'm wondering whether to read the next one too, because it's similar. Okay, go on. Go on. After the sort of discussion yesterday, I felt fear and aversion towards going deeper into the path. The idea of cessation felt very unpleasant and different to the current experience I have in meditation, which is the experience of light and energy, not of darkness and cessation. <laughs> Can you comment? Yes, the beautiful experience you have in meditation do not last. They fade away. It's one of the reasons why that after a while, if you don't understand those, what those meditations are and their purpose, you'll want them back again. And that will cause you a lot of suffering. That that's the emotional suffering of just desiring the most pleasant experience you've ever had to come back again. 
and also you have that suffering of getting old and dying. So you know, life is, many times in your life, you have a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, a lot of success, but there are times when it all goes wrong. This is life. There are times when the Buddha was really fit and healthy. In the end, he too had to pass away and die. So life has always a suffering element into it. And when you understand the nature of the mind, you're honest to it. This is one of my favorite teachers, was this nun who was bhikkhuni in the time of the Buddha, was fully enlightened. And Mara came up to her and said, no, who do you think you are saying you're enlightened? And the nun said something like, there's nothing in here, there's just suffering arising and suffering and passing away. And to me, that was a beautiful description of what it feels like to be an enlightened one. What actually is it? Why are you enlightened? What does it feel like? It's a suffering arising and suffering passing away. Until the time comes, we get the full enlightenment, what they call not Nibbana, but Pari Nibbana. How Pari says in Nibbana, nothing left. That's the Buddha under the living Kusanara. It's already enlightened. The big event was when the five candles also stopped, never arose again. And understanding that, you understand why. Yeah, you have some happiness and bliss when you're meditating. It's probably the best way your mind has been for a long time. But it doesn't last, it will change. The only way you can have a perfect full freedom from suffering is when the five candles disappear. Once you become a stream winner, you're never afraid of cessation anymore. If you're not a stream winner, you will be afraid of cessation. You don't understand it. You think cessation is annihilation. It's not annihilation. There's nothing to annihilate. Just this process finally comes to an end. At last. What is scary for a person who understands this is being reborn again. It's carrying on. So what you do, once you see this, is you help others, teach others. And I can't, the best teaching you can possibly give is that at your death, you don't get reborn again. Teaching by example is far more powerful than teaching through words. But don't be concerned there, because even the Buddha would mention that point. So some people do get afraid when I talk about letting go of yourself, of your mind and your will. But there's no choice. It's what happens. You get to the point of being a stream winner, and you realize it's just it's just a process which is terminally fading away. It can't keep going. It's not up to you. When people say, Well, can't if you're a stream winner, can't you decide to pull off your enlightenments and just come back again and again and again forever and ever and ever? If you understand the nature of the will. It's not your choice. You haven't got a choice. It's a natural process. You can't extend it. It's an automatic, beyond your sense of self, your control. You might as well be like a king canoe and tell the, the tide to come in and go out. Even our hearts don't have that power. You're letting go. Allowing things to finally cease. But it's good you're actually seeing that because you're understanding something. You're understanding just what this life really is and what enlightenment is. Okay, next question. Uh, can I just follow on yeah, a little bit or ask a follow up? Because I think yeah. um, in these questions, it seems that the fear is a fear of nothingness, which of course is not true unless we think there's something there anyway. And also somebody equates cessation to darkness, but in my understanding, it will always continue to be a pleasant process as things disappear. The way yeah. it won't suddenly switch from brightness to darkness, it will be like a gradual fading. And with that fading, there's increased peace. Isn't that also true? And peace and bliss as well. The better simile is like, uh, sometimes you look in the night sky when it's not too cold <laughs> to go out. <laughs> 
and I'm in Australia because it's called Australia. You've got the beautiful uh, Milky Way, and it is the summertime now, so there's not hardly any clouds in the sky. You can go out there, and I'm sure if I went out my room now, you could look up in the sky and see the Milky Way. But sometimes you see these little meteors, those streaks through the sky. And those meteors are lumps of ice or lumps of rock. They've been going around our solar system so many times, hundreds, thousands, millions of times. And then they, they manage to meet this planet called Earth. And they hit the, the atmosphere of Earth. And then they burn up and this beautiful, bright light. And some of these, these meteors are just, they, they turn like darkness into light. They're beautiful, they're gorgeous, and then they're gone, gone forever. And I use that as a metaphor for enlightenment. You go around samsara hundreds, thousands of times, round and round and round and round and round and round. And one day you, you hit the Dhamma by the atmosphere of planet Earth. And when you hit that Dhamma, you burn up all the defilements. You go out in this blaze of light. The great Arahats, the Ajahn Chahs, and the Buddhas. Wow. And sometimes I'm really, sometimes I feel I don't really appreciate the Buddha enough. This was a human being 25 centuries ago in India. And his teachings still go around the world. They, they reach England and Poland and Australia. They're still so incredibly alive. And the things which he taught, the jhanas and psychic powers, they still exist. Still, men and women still become enlightened. Whew. 25 centuries and it's still going strong. It hasn't diminished at all. And that is that's mind blowing. Literally, it blows your mind apart, so there's nothing left. Okay, there's still a lot of deep questions, but there's also questions from people who haven't asked anything so far. So I want to make sure they're included. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, go how do I gain more mindful and skillful speech? My talking is often impulsive and in the silence of a retreat, I realize it is intrusive and inconsiderate. Do more retreats and then you'll appreciate the danger of speech more. Speak less and your words are more valued. It is the small streams which make all the noise. The great rivers flow silently. That's what the Buddha used to say. It's like empty logs, you know, which are hollow. You hit them, it's like a drum. It really makes a noise. Solid wood, when you hit it, makes very little noise. So little by little, the more silent you are, the more people value your speech. I've had many very lovely, peaceful meditations. Sometimes lights and visions appear, but very briefly. I'm aware of fear and anticipation stopping me go further. I understand these to be upper kalesas. I try yes. to be content with the peace and joy, but I've also been wondering if I should welcome those upper kalesas with kindness and let them just be there as long as they want to stay. Yeah, that's a beautiful way because then you find that you learn how they work. And when you understand them, that's the Chinese art of war. It's a bad book I'm supposed to read because it's war, but it has so many beautiful similes there. Know your enemy, know yourself. A thousand battles fought, a thousand battles won. So know the Upikalesis. And what are they? Understand them. And then you have abilities just to let them go. And they disappear. But if you really want them to disappear, another way to do it, which I haven't really taught yet, is do the programming of your mindfulness <laughs> so the beginning of meditation when meditation is really getting hot in the sense of you know you're really getting peaceful and still then the beginning of your meditation you tell yourself if a nimitta comes up i will not be afraid if a nimitta comes up i will not be afraid if a nimitta comes up i will not be afraid it's putting an antivirus program into your mind and it's incredible how well it works. I was really surprised myself just how much it works. Because, you know, you get a limiter coming up, you usually get afraid. It's like something kicks in. So, no, I'm not going to be afraid this time. You don't actually say that, but the mind moves in that direction, not to be afraid. You don't have to say anything because you put the instructions in at a time when those instructions don't disturb the mind. It stays in there. 
to be used when it's needed. Or the other word, excitement. I will not be excited, I will not be excited, I will not be excited. In your own words, I used to say it three times and then you forget about it. So you think you're forgetting about it, you just carry on meditating. If your mind gets very peaceful, that little antivirus kicks in. Okay. Great. As part of the gradual training, there's the letting go of the household life to go forth. If we're not yet ready for that, how should we handle the path? You let go as much as you can. So you've got a household path, but you can let go of the TV. You can let go of the gardening. You can let go just, you know, these days I've visited some people's houses before COVID in places like Sydney. And even they have these little apartments with no kitchen in. You say, why do you have a kitchen? Well, oh, I don't need one. I'll just go downstairs and there's all these beautiful restaurants you know, <laughs> down on the street. And then they much better sort of uh, food than I can cook and I don't have to wash up afterwards. It's you know, pretty cheap. And I can actually get the best food in the world, all these different types of restaurants in, in central Sydney. And I have a kitchen. I thought, wow. Now, this is actually thinking a bit outside the box. What actually do you really need as a house? Nice little place, which is uh, peaceful and quiet. A nice bed to, sit, to sleep in. <clears throat> a shower and toilet, obviously. But that's about all. And so they said, well, doesn't it cost a lot going to the restaurant? She said, actually, the cost of actually getting a kitchen, building one, it's one of the most expensive parts of a house. And having to cook and wash and oh, I just worry what you're going to eat. You just go down there and oh, what's on the menu today, chef? <laughs> so, so you can understand that. It's just a different way of thinking. And it's actually cheaper. Just like I was telling someone today that I was, I was an environmentalist when I was uh, a student. We worked out even then that why actually have a car? Because it, we worked out it's cheaper anywhere in England, to go everywhere in a taxi. That you cheap than maintaining your own car. Because <laughs> cars were very expensive. You had a garage for them, they break down, you have to sell them every now and again and get a new one. And a taxi was no worry at all. You ring up and get one and then off you go. So anyway, it was interesting, just how much do we really need? And how much is it what we want? So if you're living in the lay world, see if you can Lessen your wants and just stick to your needs. Okay. Simplify. Downsize. Small houses. It's a nice thing to see in, in places like Australia, the you know, small houses movement. So you don't need such big places. All right. There's still quite a lot of um, juicy questions, Ajahn. Are you still good? Yeah, I'm still good, yeah. We might have to go over time if you want to film. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Uh, this morning I had a bit of a confusing experience during meditation. I didn't feel my body anymore. I had rather neutral feelings and couldn't tell if I was asleep or still in meditation. Also, I started to experience time totally differently. I feel hmm. very much at peace and a very nice feeling. Great. Carry on. Okay. So little by little, one gets... It's sometimes I use the simile of when you're living, say, in the countryside somewhere, and you go outside your house at night time, you can't really see properly. It takes a while for your eyes to accommodate to the lower light, for the pupils to dilate, to get you like night vision. And that's the same with meditation. When you first go into deep states of meditation, sometimes it takes a while for you to recognize what's really going on. It feels peaceful. It feels still. It's nice, but just carry on, and little by little, you learn more about it. And after a while, now you go out from a lit room into the darkness, and your pupils of the eyes get wider, get more light in, so you can actually see where you're going. Um, okay, I think one more practice question, then some more theoretical. Last oh. night I was meditating and watching the blackness in front of me. Then I thought this stillness is so still. And it occurred to me that it was everywhere, also in the space where the body is. As I did notice this stillness being really still and everywhere. 
my heart started pounding really fast and I kept uh-huh. looking at this stillness everywhere uh, and goosebumps came all over me. My heart kept racing. I remembered you saying this will pass. So I kept confident and kept with the racing heart. This kept yeah, going. Cool. And when the fi- heart finally stopped racing, I came out and saw that an hour and a half had passed. I didn't see any nimitters. I've never seen one and didn't go into a jhana, also never been in one just felt this incredible still stillness that felt so powerful. I felt electrified afterwards. My hands were tingling. Is this stillness the path? Should I look more at it than the the breath? I couldn't feel the breath, only the heart racing and not much body. Yeah, but the heart racing was a bit of a problem. So usually just the heart disappears as well. It just carries on beating. It does it by itself. You don't have to worry about it. But your excitement of getting a state of stillness when you focused on the heart, it was beating unnaturally, naturally fast. So whenever you start to become aware of the heartbeat, don't worry about it. Just see if you can actually zoom in past the heart, the stillness. The stillness is more important, more beautiful. And soon the stillness dominates so much you can't feel your heart, can't feel any part of the body. You just enjoy it and it gets more still than that even believe it or not. So you're scratching the surface of stillness. And as you go deeper, you can't feel the heart anymore. The heart is still beating, it's not stopped, you're not dead. You're just enjoying so of the mind being temporarily free from the body and the heart being everything. It gets more and more blissful. Nimitas, doesn't have to see nimitas. Just enjoy the stillness. Nimitas will come by themselves if they're necessary. Why it's does it? It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Why does what? Um, are you ready for the next one? I don't want to interrupt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, okay. no, sure. Why does hearing about, for example, the Buddha's enlightenment or the realization of Nibbana cause happiness to rise up and bloom in me? She says it does. Um, yeah. Is it because I've been told so that it happens? Conditioning, suggestibility. In other words, she's been told that it makes you happy, therefore it does. Or is there something deeper involved? That's deeper. I, if I was a betting bug, which I'm not, you can't because I've got nothing, no money, nothing to lose either. But nevertheless, <laughs> I would say that's past lives, past life memories. You may not be aware of the past lives, but your previous existences, they just have conditioned you. Especially when you hear even the word of a Buddha, the word Buddha, or the alignment of a Buddha, it brings a rise to this, this joy and happiness. As I said, you know, my family couldn't even spell the word Buddha. <laughs> no one was a Buddhist in the family. And you know, they were actually anti religious. My father, he said he saw so much suffering during the Second World War, he could never believe in a God. You can't have somebody who just allows that type of suffering which he saw firsthand to occur so he wasn't religious at all and you know didn't know what buddhism was so when i first saw my first buddhist monk that again was just really shook me i still remember where it happened in king's college cambridge in the wordsworth room amazing just that memory was so strong just it was supposed to be a buddhist talk i went up and saw this monk walking up the stairs in front of me Oh, how come that could happen? It's only because of past lives. Someone was jogging a memory from the past. So anyway, so if you get joy up because hearing the word Buddha, enlightenment of the Buddha, that's where it's coming from almost, I would say 90% sure. Okay, do you have to experience jhanas to be a stream winner? That's a brilliant question because uh, I and many other monks, we debate this. It doesn't say it specifically in the suttas, but I can't see how it can occur without a jhana. But what happens sometimes, you become on the path to being a stream winner. You're not attained to being a stream winner yet. On the path without the jhanas, but the actually, to actually to get the fruition, you do need the jhana to empower the mind, to give the data, to see, there's nothing to be afraid of when things get lost. It's blissed out, there's so much freedom. The difference between being in a prison, as I keep saying, and being free, you're outside. 
no five senses, wee. And people just, they know about prison, it's suffering, but at least you know how to survive in there. People know how to survive with a body, sort of. But the idea of it just falling away, disappearing, just a mind and then the mind going away. Whoa. That's scary for many people. If you've been outside of prison long enough, it's beautiful and free. We try and encourage as many people to break out and be free. So I can't see how you can become a stream winner without chance. That's the attainment. Okay. Is there a reason why the immaterial attainments are not mentioned in the path? Are they not necessary? Ah, even the insights I mentioned in the past. In other words, it's a path. It's a way to get to the goal. When you get to the goal, what's there? So this was fascinating. If you read the sutras, I remember just reading the, the Anguttu and Nikaya in Pali, because I don't Pali by now. When I got to the eight, you know, got the ones, the twos, the threes, and fours, the eights, I read right at the very end, you couldn't find the eightfold path mentioned there at all. The most important set of eight things in the whole Dhamma, I think you couldn't see the eightfold path there. It's in the tens. It's the eightfold path and what happens afterwards, enlightenment and the knowledge of enlightenment. The eightfold path is the path and the goal is Nibbana. So this is actually why sort of uh, that uh, even the immaterial attainments aren't mentioned there because it's not the goal. It's not necessary for the path, but it's actually helpful for the path. So what they do say in things like the Kavali Sutta, that if you do experience the immaterial attainments, then you are enlightened both ways. Upato Bhyanjana and Nibbana. And if it's only just the um, through the jhanas, no immaterial, that's Panyavimuti. So it says, Panyavimuti and Ubato Bhyanjana Vimuti. Two types of enlightenment. One, we all have the jhanas, all have to have the jhanas. But one with the immaterials, one without the immaterials. Okay, okay the next one's two questions, and after that, there's one more. <laughs> okay, so. no, no trouble. During the time of the Buddha, it said, despite many attaining jhanas, including the Buddha's two teachers, still they did not get enlightened. Uh, why was that? Were they not interpreting their jhanic observations correctly and coming to wrong views and needed the Buddha to come and teach the Dhamma? Ah, now who said that, that many people attained jhanas in the time of the Buddha, before the Buddha's enlightenment? That is not said, it is not true. It is very unlikely that Buddha's first two teachers experienced the jhana. Very unlikely. They were teaching what they thought was immaterial attainments. But after the Buddha finished with those two teachers, then the Buddha said, none of this is working. He, the only way to get the immaterial attainments is to go through the jhanas. The immaterial attainments are based on the fourth jhana. It's when you're so still that things, the mind starts to fade away. Stillness makes things disappear. So it's quite clear to me that it's very, very unlikely that those two teachers had experience of jhanas. Just like many people make jhana light these days, these monks would have made immaterial jhana light. Sounds like the thing, but not the real thing. Why do I actually say that? It's because when the Buddha have gone through all those trainings and got nowhere, including those two teachers. He remembered the time he did have jhanas, and that time was a six or seven year old boy under the rose apple tree. He had to go back that far to understand what jhana was. He didn't actually experience any jhana, at least he didn't remember he experienced any jhana under those two teachers. Also, that in the Jitta Samyutta, which I love reading out, there was the case that, that Jitta, who was a household, he was an anagami, non-returner, very famous man. And he actually went to go and see uh, uh, Mahavira, the leader of the Jains. And when he went to see the leader of the Jains, 
the, the days they were discussing about being able to have a mind which doesn't move, no thoughts, just a mind which is still. And so because they were discussing that, they asked Chitta, I hear that you know, your teacher, you know, the Buddha, says that you can actually stop the mind moving. In other words, get into jhanas. Is that true? Do you believe that? And Chitta said, the householder, I don't believe that at all. There you go. There's a very senior and famous disciple of the Buddha. And uh, he doesn't believe this is possible. It's impossible to stop Vitaka Vichara, said uh, the leader of the Jains. It's like putting your hand in the Ganges River, thinking you can stop the current, or like putting a hand up to stop the wind. It's impossible. And even the Buddha's own disciple agrees with this. And then Chitta said, uh, Venerable Nataputta, uh, which is more important, belief or experience? Oh, experiences. Exactly. I don't believe the Buddha that you can stop the mind in this way because I experience it. Whenever I like, I can enter the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, or fourth jhana. And Nataputta said, these disciples of the Buddha are very sneaky and very hard to have a conversation with. <laughs> But the point of that, it was a funny discourse, but it also revealed that the leader of the Jains in the time of the Buddha had no concept of jhanas and thought that jhana was impossible. So how could anyone say that jhanas was popular or well-known and many people had jhanas in the time of the Buddha? The most famous spiritual teacher at that time other than the Buddha, thought it was impossible. And even though our texts there, which actually say in the Devaputta Samyutta, the Buddha who discovered jhanas. Anyway. Okay. So, the, uh, go yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, there's a follow up question on the last question about whether you need the jhanas for stream winning. They say that in the Dhammapada, some people became stream winners without the jhanas just by listening to the Buddha. They entered the path to being a stream winner. But they didn't get the fruit yet until the end of their life. Now, the point is here that it's, I saw this when I was uh, translating the Vinaya from the Pali. Sometimes if like a monk or a nun does something like you, you dig a trap, and the trap is so well built that somebody's going to fall into that. They're going to die. Then they say that even though no one is dead yet, the fact that you've laid that trap means you know, that the person is dead. And you're a parachika. You have to cease being a monk, even though there's no body found yet. And they said, this is very similar. The way, it's just the idioms of Pali. The similar idiom in, in English, if you upset the triads, or if you upset a mafiosi boss, they'll come up to you and say, Venerable Chanda, Venerable Chanda, you're dead. I'm not dead, I'm alive, I'm speaking. But you know what it means, you're dead means your death is certain. And that's actually how they use these words in Pali as well. So if you've got to the path of being a stream winner, then your stream winning is certain before you die or at your death. Is certain. So even in Pali, even though you're certainly not a stream winner yet, you're just on the path of being a stream winner. We still call you a stream winner. Loose speech, confusing. That's the only thing which makes sense. Yeah. Also, I join the reminder that it is one of the factors of the Eightfold Path. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And there's no shortcut. Right. And also put us compassionate, he would have given the shortcut. Yeah. yeah. I've also heard you say, Ajahn, that some of these sudden awakenings are sort of like the snapshots, like taking a picture of somebody oh, at yeah. the, when they get their degree. But yeah. we don't see all the work they've done in the past. Yeah, or the going in there and going to the going to the tutorials and the lectures and the exams and all that sort of stuff. What they see is throwing up the hat in the air. And being given a scroll of paper by some famous person. That's not how you get a degree. <laughs> you go <gotta> work. 
Okay, uh, two more questions. <laughs> so this one is about jhana and vipassana. So it's said that jhanas are temporary and not permanent states and one needs vipassana meditation. Um, this person I think has actually studied quite a bit of vipassana. That's my guess because yeah. I know them a little bit. So, uh, and possibly these are mostly Sri Lankan teachers, possibly. Anyway, I have heard teachers say, after calming the mind, we need to switch to Vipassana meditation to see things as they truly are. What exactly is Vipassana meditation? I find this confusing as uh, I thought in the Anapana meditation by being mindful of the breath, as Ajahn explained, if I'm correct, only with the deep stilling of the mind or jhanas, true insights or reality, occur at stages of 12 to 16 of the anapana automatically without having to switch to another type of meditation thank you exactly you got it right so if you look to not he's heard it said said by whom if you look how the buddha taught you find out the buddha taught that you have to do the jhanas you have to do the whole eightfold path to be able to become enlightened and this is beautiful simile. It's in the Gatikara Sutta, Majima 64, if you want to look it up. That is where the Buddha said, you cannot, sorry, not the Gatikara, that's, that's the wrong sutta there. It's Majima 64, it's a Mahamalunkya Puta Sutta. Mm. And there, that uh, there's no way you can get to the heartwood of a tree, the pith of a tree without first going through the bark and the sapwood. In the same way, there's no way that you can get, or even know, the lower fetters, the first five fetters, and abandon them without going through jhanas. And here is the Buddha actually saying very clearly that to be a non-returner or a full enlightened one, you have, absolutely, have the jhanas. So this is actually you know, from the Buddha, how the Buddha taught. You, know, is, you say from this you have to go to that, it's an automatic process. If you experience a child, it's just a fantastic state. Of course you're going to ask, what the heck was that? And the point is, it's not just having the power of that experience, it's also just knowing just what it means. You have the words of another. Aryan, enlightened being. You have those words, instructions, and you have the experience. You can figure out what it means. Insight will come automatically. Okay, next question. Okay, last question. Okay. Most important question. How to maintain momentum in the practice in daily life? is you can't stop maintaining momentum. Once you have a taste of freedom, you just can't forget it. So in other words, sometimes this has happened. People have just meditated with me and then they disappear for a while. I said, no, I just have to keep coming back. Just, you, know, you can't ignore this, you can't forget it. And so for momentum, how do you do this in your daily life? Little by little, when you see the importance of meditation, you can always find time for it, even when you're working. When you're working in an office, you can, like this one lawyer got a cupboard in his office. He cleared out all the papers from the cupboard and he sits in there every lunch hour to meditate. He found a place and he said, I haven't got the time for it. He makes time. It's called an investment of time because half an hour meditating means you're far clearer, make less mistakes and more productive in the afternoon. You're less tired. And so little by little, you realize this meditation makes you a more productive in whatever you do, more sensitive, more innovative. Which, you know, monks like me give talks to World Computer Conferences. The keynote address at Dejon in 2019, it's a crazy thing to do. What on earth is a monk doing giving a keynote address at a World Computer Conference in uh, South Korea to all these brilliant people? One person there was the Euro uh, expert on cybersecurity. You know, 
for the European Union, the head of the Organization for Cybersecurity. Why? It's because when you meditate, you get far more innovation. Your mind is more clear and you can see deeper, even in things like computers, let alone everything else in this world. So that's actually how you bring the meditation into your worldly life. And as soon as you have an opportunity for retreat, you just take it. As soon as you have a nice monastery for a really amazing bhikkhuni, then the benefits are just huge. So if you really want to take this into worldly life, you have to support the bhikkhunis. And that's not just a joke, it's not just a marketing play. There's a huge amount of truth in there. Spiritual community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The spiritual community is a community. It's not just using you as a slave. <laughs> and a janitor <laughs> working all out so other people could enjoy their meditations. <laughs> Otherwise, you just disappear after a while. So it's a community where you don't just serve, you participate. Other people look after you. You look after them, each in your own different ways. I think okay. that is one of the um, purposes of a monastery. It's something yeah. between, I mean, it's obviously much more than daily life practice, but it's, it's somewhere between that and the retreat center, because in a retreat center, you leave and then you're just oh, yeah. back in your ordinary world. But in a monastery, you can be on retreat. And then you can surface from retreat and you're among spiritual community. So then you have a chance to yeah. actually put the teachings in practice in your daily life and have those spiritual friendships there to remind you when you're yeah. off course or, you know, how to deepen. And also you're just inspirations. Mm. So this was, oh, I don't mind going over time a bit, but there was this one monk who's a Vietnamese monk, a Theravada Vietnamese monk, gave a retreat over in Sydney, nine day retreat, started a retreat by everyone meditating together. He was going to give the first talk after half an hour of meditating and lots of other talks as well. And this monk just carried on meditating for eight days, never moved, never went to the toilet, never ate anything, never drank any water, just sat there, just like a Buddha statue. And when he, he got into the deep jhanas. And then when he came out of that, he apologized. He said, I, I'm supposed to teach you. I didn't do anything. I just was sitting here for eight days straight, not moving, not sleeping, nothing. And everybody who saw that said, you taught us. It was so inspiring. We can have all the information, but see such things are possible in today's world. That was mind-blowing. We'll never forget that. Teaching by example. No, it's just through words. It's the most powerful. You know that time I attended when I did my six-month retreat, never seeing a human being for six months? I thought that was just maybe being selfish, but other people afterwards said, no, thank you for doing that. You show that's possible, even just not going crazy afterwards. And having a wonderful time, I said, wow, thank you. So sometimes your own practice is a gift to others. And they really get off on it. <laughs> you don't always have to tell them what to do, show them what to do. Very good. Thank you, Ajahn, okay. for your generosity and giving us that extra time. <laughs> well, I enjoy it, sir. And, uh, yeah, hopefully those answers can be of help. Thank I'm you. Sure. Me, <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity to give. <laughs> okay. So I'll see you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Have a good afternoon. Have a bit of a rest after this is finished, and then have a good meditation and teaching question and answers later on. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Good night. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. <laughs>